is the um, oh crap, yeah, totally lost my notes already. Um, developer advocate for Dremio, developer and a seasoned instructor with a rich professional background, having worked with companies like Jet Ed Systems, Crossfield Digital, Campus Guard, and General Assembly. Um, and there's much more to him, but I will definitely let him expand on that more uh, along with the presentation tonight on Project Desi and Lake Cast Catalog versioning. And Alex, take it away. Uh, awesome. Awesome. And then here we go. Okay, so let me get my screen sharing going. And uh, let's do that over here. Oh, no, here, this window right here. Okay. And here we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at Dremio. So let's just kind of go into a quick introduction to who I am. Um, yes, as, as mentioned earlier, I've worked for many companies in web development and in data companies such, such as Genesis System, Crossfield, Campus Guard. But I'm also a co-author of Apache Iceberg, the Definitive Guide, which is coming out. I'll mention that again in just a second. Hosted several podcasts. And also, I just like the right code. So I've written uh, different libraries in Python and in JavaScript. Like I created a small sort of in-memory uh, document database just just for fun called Senseo DB. I've created different web frameworks like Coquito JS and um, you know a tool for helping you know work with Dremio and Apache Arrow, Dremio Simple Query. Um, lots of you know fun little libraries uh, I've written over the years. But also again, I am one of the co-authors of Apache Iceberg: The Definitive Guide. Uh, which will be coming out early next year, but you can get an early release copy for free just by scanning that QR code, uh, which talks all about what Apache Iceberg, the, the table format is, why it doesn't matter, what is a lake house, um, how would you implement the lake house, and how I, what Iceberg's role is in implementing a day lake house, and all, all of that fun jazz, which is about, I think, was it this morning that I wrote the, the final last couple lines? So it's it's done. The manuscript's done. Um, so now it's just about editing and just finalizing it. Um, also, I'm the host of several podcasts. So every week at Dremio, we do a podcast called Gnarly Data Waves, where we have uh, all sorts of great people come in. Like this week, we had a founder of a company called Bob Plan Labs, who's also building a startup on Nessie, which is going to be the topic of my talk tonight. Last week, we had NetApp talking about how they, they, they reduce their costs. Um, next week, we're going to have Fivetran. So... Always really interesting conversations there. Um, then we have three podcasts where I just kind of talk about data in general, such as uh, In the Grand Schema of Things, Data Nation, Select Star from Data Lake. All three podcasts, I talk about different uh, random uh, data topics. So those are all fun. They're all on Spotify and iTunes. And with that, let's get into our main topic. So again, I'm talking about Nessie and catalog versioning. But to really appreciate why, why we would want Nessie and why do we want catalog versioning, we need to understand sort of the context of, hey, you want a data lake house. Okay, so for the longest time, we've had data lakes, okay, where basically, we, and we basically they were just treated as big dumping grounds for data because I didn't want to put all my data in the data warehouse. One, unstructured data can't go in there, and two, putting all my structured data, well, I'm paying a lot of money to store all that data there, and I'm not probably not using all of it. So generally, you would have some data lake where you would just kind of dump all that uh, that that data, whether it would be like an on-prem Hadoop cluster or uh, in the cloud on S3 or ADLS, you would store all that data and that'd be your data lake. And then you would run some queries, you would do some analytics with that data, some ad hoc uh, work. Um, but it was typically read, you weren't doing a lot of mutations, you weren't doing a lot of the stuff you would normally do in a data warehouse. The reason being is because the abstractions that existed, things like Hive tables, we're good for doing, you know, those sort of read-only ad hoc queries, you know, for a well-partitioned table, but they didn't work so great for kind of supplanting the typical warehouse functionality. Like you couldn't really do acid transactions, um, and the transactions you could have were very limited and slow, especially when you're trying to do updates and deletes, if you could do them at all. Um, you know, stats on the tables were often stale. Those are just all sorts of like imperfections. So there's like a sort of this new movement of saying, hey, how about would the missing piece is a metadata layer? Because if we think of the, about the way like a database or a data warehouse works, they're just abstractions over a bunch of different unique components. Okay, every database, every data warehouse has a storage layer where they talk about how, where they store the data and how they store the data. There's the compute layer that handles all processing of queries against that data. And we have that in a data lake, right? We have Query engines like Dremio, like Trino, like Presto that allow us to query the data lake. We have storage, again, Hadoop, S3. 
what we don't have that databases and data warehouses have is like this metadata layer that allows the processing of that data to be smarter. Okay, and that this is where table formats come into play. The Apache icebergs, the Apache hoodies, uh, the Delta lakes, they become this metadata layer that allows for that more intelligent, intelligent processing of the data in your data lake so that way you can have asset transactions, more performant queries, time travel, um, all sorts of schema evolution, all these great features that you would normally experience in a data warehouse as you just take for granted and now have them on the data in your data lake by just inserting that table format layer. But the other thing that's needed is, okay, great, I have these tables and I have this metadata about this table that allows me to work with it smarter, but I also need to track those tables. And that's where the catalog comes into place. So now you're starting to see a lot of companies getting into the catalog space. So like Dremio, we have our Dremio Arctic catalog. You have Tabular with their catalog for iceberg tables. You have uh, Databricks with their Unity catalog. Now saying, okay, well, we have these formats that allow us to create smart tables in our data lake, but we need to create a tool that allows us to track those smart tables in our data lake. That way the, the different tools that want to interact with those tables can easily discover them. Okay, so when I talk about the catalog, I'm really just talking about the, the mechanism that allows engines to discover the metadata for your different tables on your data lake house. Okay, cool. So when I talk about data lake, data lake house, that distinction is that sort of that table format and catalog layer that wasn't there before that really enables all these sort of new patterns. So that way you now can pretty much do whatever you did on a data warehouse in the data lake house for the most part. But a very unique trend that's starting to happen is that people are starting to look into this trend called data as code. The idea of bringing sort of like code like practices to data. And this is particularly in the versioning space. And there's a bunch of different approaches to this that are, are, are versioning out. But the idea is just like we use Git for code. So when I use Git to write code, the nice things about it is I have commits. So that way, if I ever need to go back in time to a place where my code was in better shape, I can do that. Or if I want to experiment with my code, I can create a branch and then merge those changes if I'm happy with them. Okay. But until then, so for example, if I'm Facebook, well, you know, you might be deployed off, let's say, production branch. But, you know, if someone's making a change on some other branch, they're not affecting the production version of Facebook that everyone's using while they make those changes to the code. And that allows, you know, that kind of level of experimentation and, and, and collaboration and uh, better work on code. So why can't there be data? Why can't we do that with data where we can have, you know, the all my mainline queries are hitting one branch, but maybe ingesting new data or doing experimentation or development of new platforms are happening on other branches where the work that's being done on those branches doesn't necessarily affect sort of my mainline branch where queries are coming in. Okay, so that's what this whole data, and this includes a couple of features that you, you're familiar with from Git. The ability to have commits, so all these little snapshots of changes in my artifacts. Tagging, being able to say, hey, give a name to a particular a particular snapshot so I can easily recall that snapshot. And branching, so that way I can create alternate paths of snapshots that, that sort of basically isolate work that I want isolated and the ability to merge in those changes. Okay, and there's different ways this, this can exist now. Like you have platforms like LakeFS that do this at the file level, okay, but require you to use an S3 compliant file layer in order to get that file level versioning. You have formats like Apache Iceberg, which have it built into the format, but at the table level. So you can only version one table at a time and do this abstraction at one level at a time. Well, what I'm talking about today is a open source project called Nessie that brings this whole, the benefits of versioning to the catalog level. And again, just to kind of reiterate those benefits of versioning is able to kind of isolate work. I can do new, new, no copy experimentation. So going back to Git, when I create a branch, I'm not copying my code. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not increasing my hard drive imprint because I created a branch, but I'm still able to kind of create these branching changes to my code. Uh, multi-table transactions. So in the Git world, I'm able to make edits to multiple files and commit them at the same time. In the world of data, I'd like to be able to make changes to multiple tables because those tables might be part of a, you know, they're all part of a join. And if I only update them one at a time, there could be inconsistent joins. So I really want to publish those changes simultaneously through one asset transaction. The ability to roll back my data, you know, instead of having to spend a week in backfilling my data, I'd like to be able to just roll back my data and just rerun the job. That'd be nice. Um, reproducibility. 
the ability to tag a particular snapshot that I want to run certain tests against and be able to easily recall that point in time, let's say like an end of month tag. So that way, if I ever need to run data against how the data was at the end of a particular month, I have a tag for that. Okay. The ability, not only when I isolate that ingestion, I can use that isolation to do consistency, quality, and data validation. All of this is enabled by the ability to do versioning, again, like Git. But Nessie does this versioning at the catalog level. So Nessie is a catalog for particularly Apache Iceberg tables, but in the future, it can expand to other tables. Its architecture does enable it to pretty much track anything. Um, but what Nessie is, it's a catalog for your lake house and it'll track different objects. But right now it's mainly like folders and tables that it can track uh, and views it can track on your lake house. So essentially what it is, is like you have a commit that tracks sort of what are sort of the current state of the different objects in your lake house, your different tables, your different folders, your different views. And just like Git, each commit can capture the changes to those objects uh, as those changes occur. And if I want to, if I want to isolate some changes, I can create a branch. So let's say here I have two iceberg tables that are currently on their snapshot one. I create a branch. And so now I have this alternate ETL branch because I found I'm ingesting some data into table B. So then I make a change to table B. So now table B is pointing to snapshot number two. And now I, I've done my tests, I've done my validations, I've done all my consistency checks, and now I'm ready to publish those changes to the, to the public or to my consumers. And then I can merge that branch. And now the newest commit back on the main branch will reflect those changes. And I can make those changes to multiple tables and whatnot. And the cool thing is again, Query engines, they can, you know, usually by default, they'll query the main branch. And you could, if you did want to query a different branch, you can specify that. So it gives that flexibility uh, to the consumers if they have access to those other branches. Okay, now the specific benefits when you, when you bring this versioning concept to the catalog level is you, you get these catalog level operations, not just table level, not just file level, okay? I'm saying, hey, I'm creating an alternate changes to my tables. And that's the abstraction that, you know, from an analytical standpoint, we're generally used to working with, okay? I don't like to think of my data set as a thousand files. I like to think of it as a table. So being able to work with a catalog of tables brings a much easier abstraction for me to think through when I'm trying to think through like how I want to kind of do these operations. Um, and the cool thing is that I can do them at a multi-table level because it's catalog level. So when I branch, I'm not branching a single table, I'm, bra I'm branching my entire catalog. So I can make changes to all the tables and they're all isolated. When I merge, I'm merging in changes to all the tables. When I tag, hey, I am tagging the state of all my tables at a particular time. When I roll back, I'm rolling back all the tables in my catalog to a particular time. Um, I mean, you can get more granular if you want, but I mean, that's the benefit of it. Okay, so, if, and then it allows you to have patterns and also again, it's a lot, it can be a lot less tedious in doing that at the table level. Okay, it's open source. Okay, so that allows you to customize it to your needs. Um, allows you to allows you to take advantage of the of the open source community, um, and all the other benefits of open source. And there's actually a couple different now couple different platforms that are being built on top of Nessie. We'll talk more about that towards the end. You have a cloud managed service. So Dremio, the company I work for, does have a service where if you can deploy your own Nessie server and maintain your own Nessie server, and it's your server, you set up your own authentication, you set up how it works. Um, but also you can, if you don't want to have this, to do all that maintenance, you can have a cloud managed uh, deployment uh, through Dremio Arctic, our, our catalog service. Um, this is now kind of pretty much built into the platform. Essentially it's it's the catalog plus a bunch of lake, manage, lake house management features like autom optimization, um, maintenance of your, of your tables. Uh, it's cloud agnostic. It doesn't matter what cloud you use. It doesn't care where your data is stored because Nessie is not storing your data. Nessie is not the file system. Nessie is just tracking the ca the references that the catalog needs to where your things are at. Okay, so your iceberg tables will still be stored on, they could be stored on Azure, they could be stored on AWS, it could be stored on Google. It doesn't matter. Nessie can still track those objects through sort of its, its, its catalog metadata. It's uh, storage agnostic. Okay, it is, whether you, if you're not in the cloud at all, you could be using HDFS. It doesn't matter what file system you use because basically it's just tracking sort of like a file path and it's up to the engine to know how to read that file path. Um, access control has access control and cleanup features. Okay, because it can be tricky to think of, okay, well, I have 
a snapshot that's expired on branch A, but it's not expand, expired on branch B and C. So which files should be, which data files should be cleaned up? Well, Nessie has a thing called uh, GC Cleaner that figures out all that stuff for you. So you just work with your iceberg tables like you normally would, and it will figure out, hey, which data files are no longer needed and to clean up that file space from your storage. Uh, as your tables change, it'll clean up all the unnecessary files for you. Okay, just kind of give you an example of this usage. And again, Nessie is compatible with several different engines. So one like the Dremio query engine, but also compatible with Trino, with Presto, with Spark, with Flink. Okay, that's the, another nice thing about a catalog. It makes your tables portable. So now, not only do you get all these catalog versioning features when you're using Nessie, but it also becomes a way that bundle all your Apache Iceberg tables and bring them from engine to engine. And then you can take advantage of these branches from engine to engine. So you could create a branch, do some ingestion work in Spark, Dremio will be able to see that branch and let you do the rest of the work from there. Um, so it allows you to do this branching across engines, which is really nice. Um, but in this example, in this example, we're using Dremio SQL syntax, uh, just to specify what the SQL syntax is. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a branch. Okay. And just to kind of first actually just set up, set up the story here, the narrative here. This is like the story is we're a company that does like virtual assistants. Okay. So basically we have customers who are in need of virtual assistants. And then we have people who want to be virtual assistants and we connect them together. Okay. Now what's happened is that, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing in another month of sales into our analytics side. So we're doing that ingestion. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a branch to stage those changes. So I create a branch and then I'm going to switch over to that branch using this use branch command. So that means going forward, I'll be in that branch kind of like using uh, if you're using uh, Git, it would be like checkout branch. Okay. And then in this case, I'm just setting up my staging data. So I'm just doing a CTAS of this, the data, the sales that I have to stage and then putting them into an iceberg table. Okay. And then I'm doing a merge into statement or an upsert statement in order to take my existing sales table and add in all the data for this new sales table. So it will match them based on ID. And then if you know, that record is already there, it'll update it. If it's not there, it'll insert it. Um, but then at that point we'll have updated the data. And again, at this point, after that upsert, that upsert occurred on the branch. So that means even though I've just added new records, none of those records are visible to, you know, all my downstream data consumers because all their queries are going to be hitting the main branch, not the branch that I just created. So they're not seeing these transactions. Okay. So again, I'm going to go use the branch that I created. Okay, and I'm going to do some like, you know, I'm going to do some checks. So I'm going to do a referential integrity check because I want to make sure that every new sale is referring to an assistant that exists and referring to a customer that exists, um, you know, in my fact tables. So I do that referential integrity count and, you know, maybe I find that that isn't the case. There's something wrong. Okay, so I could do a rollback as a way to kind of deal with that problem. So in this case, I can do this command here where I'm actually saying, hey, this branch, something is wrong. I want to set this branch back to a previous commit and I can just find that commit hash. And you can also do this with like a timestamp and then set it back uh, to that time. And now basically any mistakes you've made have been undone. Okay. Instead of having to like sort of more manually go back and uh, remove all those records. Okay. Or instead of manually doing it, the other way people will do it is you'll just create a whole copied environment. You'll create like a whole separate copy and then swap them out after the fact. And you're still kind of using a lot of storage in that interim and doing much more heavy processing than doing sort of these more incremental transactions and still having the ability to kind of easily uh, remedy uh, problems. Okay. Oh, where did that? Okay. Here we go. Multi-table transactions. So again, long as I'm in my branch, I can do transactions across multiple tables. And again, all those transactions are not visible to my downstream consumers until I merge those changes in. And then those changes will all appear simultaneously as one large atomic transaction. So allowing to just to do multi-table transactions. And the cool thing here is that the form of the way this takes place, it offers a lot more flexibility than the traditional sort of transaction uh, abstraction we see. So usually if you're using something like pretty much any database or Snowflake or something like that, you usually have the syntax of like begin transaction, you do a bunch of things and then you end the transaction. But it's all part of one transaction that occurs at one time. The cool thing about this approach is that it doesn't have all have to happen at one time. I could ingest the data 
you know, I could have I set up a branch, ingest data from Spark and Flink, use some other engine to do data validation, maybe do some transformations from somewhere else, all across different transactions. And again, at no point is any of that data visible to my downstream consumers until at some point I merge that branch in. So it can be so those changes can not only occur across multiple tables, but they can occur across multiple tools being done by multiple users. Basically, until you're done and you merge it. That's, that's not visible to your downstream consumer. So it offers a lot of flexibility in sort of how you isolate those changes and what you can do while those changes are isolated um, that aren't necessarily available in sort of the, today's paradigm of begin transaction and transaction. Um, merge branch. Okay, so here we're just merging the branch. So again, in a simple, it's just simple SQL. Everything can be done through simple SQL, which is really nice. Makes it really easy, easy so that way it's not just the engineers who could take advantage of it. You know, if analysts have use cases, maybe they want to just create like a environment that they want to play around with without creating a copy, but that way they can go, you know, do run some experimental updates and deletes to, to see how it affects their models. They can do that without having to like ask for a whole entire copy of the data to be created in a separate environment for them. They can just create a branch, use it. And again, changes can be easily merged. Everything's just done really easily through uh, this SQL access access okay um so that is what nessie is and what nessie does it provides versioning at the catalog level for working with your data lake house um this kind of concludes the presentation for today uh, but again reminder my name is alex merced i am the host of the following podcasts so do subscribe to these podcasts on itunes and google play um or um spotify i spend a lot of time talking about things like nessie apache iceberg data lake house dremio on these so if you want to hear more about those work and kind of go deeper into sort of like how they're architected and, and why they provide like new possibilities, like for example, um, right now I'm putting together some talks. I'm just talking about like the possibility when you put all these things together to kind of have a world where you can almost not perfectly, but almost have a zero ETL world and have a world that kind of basically, instead of building all these like data marts uh, that are built on, you know, piles and piles of pipelines, you know, building sort of like these virtual data marts that essentially there's no copying, there's no movement of data to get the data in, the zero ETL piece, and there's no movement of data in modeling your warehouse, the virtual data, the virtual data warehouse piece, and you still have that all be done performantly uh, because of the architecture of a lot of these open source components and engines. Um, so yeah, subscribe if you want to hear more about that. And with that, what I'll do is I will open it up to questions. So any questions anyone has about uh, Nessie and catalog versioning. Hi, Alex. Yeah, that, that's a great talk. Um, yeah, I have a few question. Like, um, yeah, I'm late. Um, so, so you mentioned so, so uh, the Nessie it only works for iceberg, right? Uh, so how mm -hmm. go for it. How how about other like uh, for example, like a hoodie or like Delta Lake, like. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, theoretically, it shouldn't be too hard to build support for them. It doesn't exist currently. Uh, it doesn't mean it won't exist in the future. They, it, they did build Delta Lake support for it once upon a time, but it required a pull request to the Delta Lake core repository, which never got merged. So that kind of went stale. Uh, they do plan on revisiting that again. Because um, essentially, like, when what's happening under the hood is that it's just literally, like, each object is just a metadata, like a, a metadata object. So it's just going to say like, let's say I have a table called, uh, and the namespace for that table is db dot table one. Well, in Nessie, it's just going to have an object that has a key called db dot table one, and then it's going to have another little object associated with it that meets a certain schema. So right now, the schemas that are built into Nessie are uh, iceberg table, iceberg view. Uh, namespace, which is a folder, um, and um, uh, then there's yeah, there's Delta Lake table and Delta Lake view. So technically, the Delta Lake schemas are there. There's just there's just some stuff they have to try to get into the actual Delta Lake table format for that to work seamlessly. Uh, with Hoodie, theoretically, someone could make the contributions and it could work um, because at the end of the day, like really, all the engine would need to know is like where where is it located. So I could, you could easily make a schema that just says, okay, hoodie table or, um, and then it's just like a, a folder location of where that hoodie table is located. And assuming the engine knows how to read 
uh, a hoodie table would be able to read it. So Nessie's really flexible. So it, it'll probably eventually have all that built in. Although, but because it's open source, if you need to modify that for that per particular use case, you probably could pretty easily. Um, but right now, it, it is it is mainly it is mainly designed and functional around Apache Iceberg. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have another question. So, like, um, um, yeah, I feel like uh, you know, Iceberg is really like for big data. Like, uh, mm -hmm. so on um, potentially on on a uh, faster. Right. So, how about like uh, for a single, you know, for for a laptop or like you know, like your local machine? Like, um, do you recommend also you use this kind of uh, infrastructure or like how how does it compare to DVC, another like versioning data versioning tools? Um, I mean, you can. I mean, actually, I have a I have a blog post that I posted on uh, dremio.com slash blog where I actually show you how to set up Nessie on your laptop. And set up Dremio and actually just kind of see what that workflow looks like. I mean, I pro like if you're we're, if we're talking about something that can fit inside a single parquet file, you probably don't need a table format, um, and probably a, a lot of these patterns don't become as necessary yet. But I mean, if you have some data sets that certainly starts stretching across multiple parquet files, that's when a table format starts becoming really beneficial, because then it's going to provide you that metadata to skip some of those uh, data files. Um, so it really just depends on like how many data sets you have that are across multiple data files. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be at a, at a big scale. I mean, even if you, if, even if it was like 20 data files, but the file, but the data files were well sorted and partitioned, um, you know, Apache iceberg will provide you query benefit or any of the table formats will provide you faster queries of that data set because it'll help because the engine can just skip some of those files right off the bat. Um, using the metadata from that table format. But if most data sets are like probably like let's say under a gig and fit in a single parquet file, that's probably all you need. And you can probably be fine with S3 at that scale. But it doesn't hurt once you start having more and more data sets that are stretching across several data files to start thinking about, hey, maybe we start adopting a table format and start building out the infrastructure with Nessie. And especially nowadays, it's much more lightweight. Especially with like uh, the Dremio Arctic catalogs, it's free. Like you can start up, a, you can start up a Dremio account for free, and the catalogs are just built in, and you can start tracking those tables right there. And there's no cost to that. Um, so you can you take advantage of this pretty easily uh, if needed. But again, I wouldn't necessarily rush to it if your data, if your average data set is not stretched across multiple parquet files. Cool. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry if uh, no, no other question. Yeah, I want to ask another one. Oh, go for it. Go for um, it. Oh, thank you. So, um, so like 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 you said, the uh, um, Nancy is like a metadata, just a metadata layer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a very lightweight kind of uh, file mm -hmm. structure. Like how, you know, if you make changes to a to the to your underlying like uh, iceberg data sets, like how how you keep tracking all the version like through metadata because the data for example you, you just make a lot of you know changes like mm -hmm. uh like how how you know like they keep tracking all the changes like uh efficiently because because for for some other tool my understanding for dvc like a lot of machine learning application you use that to track the you know data changes like it has a uh caching actually a caching layer under the hood like uh i think it's not very efficient like uh mm -hmm. it just keep all the version of your data sets like uh but how how like nicely and like work under the hood like keep keep all the version like, yeah i mean for this attract changes like it's it's built to like when they first started creating nessie they originally experimented to see hey could git handle this like just use git and that turned out not to be able to handle the, through, the throughput needed for like very, very, very frequent changes. Um, but the way the Apache Iceberg format works, so this works pretty well with the Apache Iceberg format, is that the way that when the transaction ends, that's when the catalog is updated. So essentially, like, let's say there, every time a, a transaction completes, the last step in that completion would be to, up to, to tell the catalog, hey, this thing has changed. This is the new metadata file. Um, so basically, really all that's changing in Nessie is one file path. 
So basically you're just saying, hey, the file path to the meta, because in every iceberg table, there's like one overarching metadata file that essentially is used to understand all the other metadata files. So basically all that matters is that the engine knows what that, where the newest version of that file is. So essentially at the end of every iceberg transaction, the catalog, the only update that's made to the catalog is just literally swapping out that one file reference saying, okay, hey, we're not using the version one metadata. Now we're using the version two metadata, then the version three metadata. So the actual update's pretty lightweight. And then the engine will just grab that file reference from the catalog. And then all the more granular metadata is derived from that metadata file that's written to disk uh, during, the during the actual update or create tr transaction. I see. So, so, so it, it used the uh, iceberg like timestamp, like those functionality, right? Yeah, behind, yeah. So, um, the so the actual table metadata is really the light, the, the heavy lifting on the table level metadata is still on iceberg and in the iceberg metadata files. Mm -hmm. But, but Nest is just tracking, is allows you to create branching paths of what is the most recent metadata file. So that way you end up creating, so instead of like usually like iceberg going version one, version two, version three, version four. But then what happens if you create a branch, the version four on the branch might be different than the version four on the main line, because now there it's kind of like a separate chain that it's tracking. Um, it's, um, let me go back to the slide here. Uh, okay, so like, so essentially what's happening is that next, like for example, if I say do a transaction, and I say do it on this branch, it's gonna do it based on whatever the most recent snapshot is at the tip of this branch. So in this case, snapshot one, but let's pretend it was like snapshot five. And this one, the latest is snapshot five and the latest on this one is snapshot four. Well, if I do the transaction here, it's gonna create snapshot six, um, but that's only gonna be visible on this branch. And then when I merge it, it'll reconcile all that. Um, but uh, that's essentially what's going on in the hood. And the reason, but the, the, the fundamental point is that it can handle very high throughput because the actual what changes from transaction to transaction is very, very lightweight. It's, it's just it's basically a single file path uh, that gets swapped out. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, Go for it. Uh, another thing is like uh, for AWS, like uh, there's a glue catalog, right? Mm -hmm. So how, like, like, how do you, how, is it, uh, can, like the NASA can be used in, in that framework or like, how, how does it compare to glue catalog? Um, they would be far as like being the place where you list your iceberg tables, they would be mutually exclusive currently. So this is kind of one of the, the things that sort of still being figured out in the world of iceberg, where basically generally you don't want to have your iceberg tables in more than one catalog, because what happens is that when you do a transaction, it only updates whatever catalog is connected. So if I had, if I had the same table tracked by AWS glue and Nessie, but then, you know, I'm using Nessie to do my updates. Well, Nessie knows about the new snapshot, but then AWS Glue doesn't know about the new snapshot. So it's still pointing to the old snapshot. So it's the data won't be consistent. Um, so if I want to use AWS Glue, that kind of precludes me from using Nessie. Um, what some platforms do, and, uh, and I imagine you'll start seeing more of this in the future, is what they'll do is you might have multiple catalogs that you treat as sort of like a read-only catalog. And then basically, let's say Nessie is your main catalog there might be some mechanism you can use to sync it to the AWS Glue catalog. So that way, if you do want to do like um, things where you need AWS Glue to do to access certain features on AWS, it could just, you know, let's say every hour go in there and just like update all the references in that other catalog um, or, or, or more frequently, depending on your needs. Um, like Tabular does that now uh, with AWS Glue currently, where if you're using the Tabular catalog, and again, basically, you generally use one catalog. So it's it's a difficult choice because every different catalog has different pros and cons. Um, but let's say you're using the tabular catalog, they do have like a switch you can say, okay, say sync this table to your AWS glue. And then you get to use their, their features, but then you're, it'll ref, you can at least read the table from AWS glue. But again, it's a one way thing. Like you still couldn't write from AWS glue if you're using, if you're using from the, from the glue catalog. Um, so it's one of those things that if you're building an Apache iceberg, data lake house, the really the first thing you really want to kind of think about is what are your options for catalog and figure out which catalog kind of meets your needs. Cause once you choose that catalog, that's, that's your catalog. You can, you can change it, but you generally are always going to just have sort of a catalog that's fulfilling that role. So it's either Nessie or AWS glue or tabular 
or et cetera, et cetera. Oh, oh. does it support all the cloud major cloud platform? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, Desi is, cl is is cloud agnostic, so you can use it with any platform. Any, mm -hmm. um, you know, less well, this is it's very popular for people who want to do like um, Iceberg on ADLS, because like you know there really isn't, or at least up until recently there really hasn't been like an AWS glue thing on a on Azure. So then this kind of offered a, some sort of catalog that they could use um, on on the Azure side of things, because uh, Nessie is at the end of the day, it's just it's it's. You can choose the backend you use for Nessie. So by default, I think it uses like, well, if you just spin up the Docker container, it's just save everything in memory, but you can use like RocksDB. You can use uh, pretty much any database, uh, MongoDB, you know, all these different things for it to store like the metadata information. And that's all it really cares about. Like basically it's a REST API and then it stores all these, all this, all its metadata in some store somewhere. And then all the engines, no matter where the data is stored, are just interacting it through its REST API. So if I, let's say Spark is interacting with Nessie, Spark is really just in REST API calls to get the latest object for like the table it's looking for saying, hey, I'm looking for table A. And it's going to send back the, just the file path to the metadata. And then Nessie's done. Like that's Nessie's role in the whole transaction. So then all those files, it's up to Spark to really worry about, hey, can I read the files on Google? Can I read the files on Azure? Can I read the files on, on, on S3? Because at that point, Nessie's out of the picture. Nessie just tells you, hey, where the metadata is, and then the engine takes it from there. Cool. cool. Any other uh, questions? Cool. And, and just a reminder as well, um, a lot of the stuff that was, was asked um, covered on Dremio's YouTube channel, um, where mm -hmm. the Tampa Data, Data Engineering Group has had previous recordings. So feel free to check those out. Also check out the podcast. I think Gnarly has a lot of these things are in like really nice small little snippets that cover a lot of topics. So it's very, very useful if we covered a lot of this. Um, uh, agree. Gnarly Dataways has a lot of great content every week. Uh, again, the great thing about that one is like it's not just me talking every week. We have people from all over the place coming up for that one, uh, generally talking about like a lot of these technologies and like how they've used them. Like the, the episode we did with NetApp a few weeks ago is really interesting because it shows, shows how they implemented some of these lake house patterns and they literally cut down their total cost of ownership for their data infrastructure by like 30%. It was pretty interesting the way they did it. Um, and there's some other stories like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty fun. It's a pretty fun listen. But uh, with that, again, this recording will be posted on uh, the Dremio YouTube channel if you want to watch this again. And it's been wonderful uh, being here and meeting everyone. Always always happy to, to see you again, Joe, and be here at the Tampa Data Engineering Group. And uh, yeah. No, yeah, absolutely a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate everybody else showing up as well. Thanks so much.